subscribe to our channel and press the bell icon so that you never miss any video lesson from Rao's IES Study Circle. Join the official Telegram channel of Rao's IES Study Circle to stay updated and get all the materials on the Telegram. The link to the channel can be found in the description box. Hello and welcome to Daily News Simplified, an answer to what, why and how of newspaper reading from UPSC Civil Services Examination Perspective. Today's DNS, dated 29th of August 2022, shall be taken up by me and Jadin sir. And these are the list of the news which we'll be taking up for today's discussion. So on this note, let's start our today's discussion from prelims and mains perspective. Now let's take up this news appearing in the text and context section on page number 8. Now this news says, the concerns around Aadhaar voter ID linkage, why is the election commission keen on voters linking their Aadhaar with voter IDs? So to link voter ID with Aadhaar, the union government has already introduced the Election Laws Amendment Act of 2021 as a part of electoral reforms. And for this purpose, amendments have been made in the Representation of People Act 1950 and also 1951. However, this amendment linking Aadhaar with voter ID has been opposed and concerns with respect to violation of right to privacy and also disenfranchisement of voters has been raised. So, it is in these backdrops, this article further highlights about certain other concerns also with respect to Aadhaar voter ID linkage. Now, while discussing about this linkage, the judgment of Putta Swami on right to privacy becomes important and also the fact that use of Aadhaar is mandatory only if a person uses subsidies, benefits or services of the government of India or the government of a state for which the expense is incurred either through the Consolidated Fund of India or through the Consolidated Fund of State. And any aspect other than these that is subsidies, benefits or services provided by the central government use of Aadhaar is not mandatory and it is voluntary. And in this regard, the Putta Swami judgment had stated that any person cannot be denied benefit if Aadhaar based authentication did not take place. However, we know that in our day to day life, usage of Aadhaar and Aadhaar based authentication has more or less become mandatory. So the question is that why Aadhaar based authentication is preferred and why the proposal is to link voter ID with Aadhaar and not with any other government documents such as driving license or even a PAN card. So here the reasons for Aadhaar based authentication is the widespread use of Aadhaar because as of now almost around 97.1% of Indian citizens have an Aadhaar card. The second reason for widespread use of Aadhaar is because of its biometric authentication process and also because the biometric authentication and verification process is considered more reliable, quick, cost effective and accurate, it is because of this linkage of voter ID with Aadhaar has been considered. And the third reason for Aadhaar based authentication is to weed out duplication especially with respect to voter IDs that is in case a person if they have more than one voter IDs then such extra voter IDs of that persons will be weeded out or will be made ineffective. Now despite these reasons still there are concerns with respect to usage of Aadhaar based authentication for voter ID linkage purpose. And the whole point here is that use of Aadhaar is not mandatory unless it is used for availing subsidies, benefits or services provided by the government of India or the government of state for which the expense is incurred through Consolidated Fund of India or the Consolidated Fund of State. Now based on the Election Laws Amendment Act of 2021, amendments were also made in Representation of People Act 1950 and also 1951. And based on these changes, Rule 26B was added in the Registration of Electors Rule 1960. Now this Rule 26B provides for Form 6B. Now the problem with respect to Form 6B is that according to this form, voters needs to provide either their Aadhaar details or other listed documents. But this other listed documents has to be given only if the person does not have an Aadhaar card. So more or less this form in a way mandates the use of Aadhaar for the purpose of 
voter ID linkage. So it is in this regard, this article says that this particular form 6B does not clear the confusion on the voluntary use of Aadhaar and also goes against the Putta Swami judgment, particularly with respect to the aspect of proportionality. So the issues highlighted in this article with respect to Aadhaar voter ID linkage is the fact that Aadhaar based authentication makes use of Aadhaar mandatory through Form 6B provided under Rule 26B of Registration of Electors Rule 1960. Now another concern highlighted in this article is that Aadhaar based authentication process has an overall error rate of 12%. However, this error rate may also vary or may also increase. Now this error rate has also been highlighted especially with respect to the linkage program that is linkage of Aadhaar with voter ID which was carried out by the Andhra Pradesh government and this voter ID and Aadhaar linkage led to disenfranchisement of a substantial number of voters close to 30 lakhs. So this aspect has also been highlighted as one of the issues regarding Aadhaar voter ID linkage. Now another concern with respect to Aadhaar voter ID linkage is that Aadhaar card is issued to residents and not to citizens and voter ID is only for citizens of India. So the article says that demographic and biometric information which is provided in the Aadhaar card will be linked to the information of voter ID. Now this may lead to creation of surveillance state and it may lead to violation of privacy rights which has been mandated as part of article 21 according to Putta Swami judgment and also the fact that this violates proportionality. Now the Putta Swami judgment stated that just like any other fundamental rights, right to privacy as a part of article 21 is not an absolute right and will be subject to reasonable restriction. However, these reasonable restrictions must be justified on grounds of legality, need and proportionality. Now proportionality here refers to that is the law infringing right to privacy must be proportional and not arbitrary or unreasonable. So these are some of the issues which has been highlighted in this particular article regarding voter ID and Aadhaar linkage. So as a way forward, the government must clarify whether non-linkage of Aadhaar with voter ID of citizens would lead to their disenfranchisement. Further, the government must come up with an alternative solution if names of citizens are deleted from the electoral roll during the process of authentication, that is during the process of linkage with Aadhaar. And also there is a need for further clarification on Form B provided under Rule 26B. Thus, to address the concerns, the government must clarify these important aspects with respect to Aadhaar voter ID linkage. Now, this article becomes important both from the perspective of prelims and also from the perspective of mains examination under GS Paper 2 of Polity and Governance, particularly with respect to aspects of elections. The next news to be taken up appears on page number 11 and it mentions about the Kutch branch canal which was recently inaugurated by Prime Minister Narendra Modi. So this news says that Prime Minister has inaugurated the 357.18 km long Kutch branch canal which stretched from Sardar Sarovar Narmada Dam in Gujarat. Now this canal that is the Kutch branch canal will off take from the Narmada main canal that is here and it will travel towards the run of Kutch. So it says that the Kutch branch canal off takes from the Narmada main canal near Radhanpur and crosses the little run of Kutch before entering Kutch near Rapur. So this news mainly becomes important from your prelims perspective and here you need to understand about the Kutch branch canal and also certain challenges which were encountered while constructing the Kutch branch canal as water had to be reached to the arid areas of run of Kutch. Now despite the importance of the Kutch branch canal which will provide waters to the arid areas of run of Kutch in Gujarat, there were many challenges which were encountered during the completion of the project. And because of this, many engineering challenges were faced while constructing the terrain on the run of Kutch. Another challenge was regarding land acquisition of around 115 hectares which were pending in areas such as Anjar, 
गांधीधाम मांडवी एंड मुंद्रा तालुका कवरिंग अ टोटल एरिया ऑफ अप्रॉक्स 13.86 किलोमीटर्स ना अनदर चैलेंज व्हिच वाज फेस्ड वाइल कंप्लीटिंग द प्रोजेक्ट वाज साइस्मिक एक्टिविटी एज द इंजीनियर्स हैड टू अकाउंट फॉर द इंक्रीज साइस्मिक एक्टिविटी इन द रन ऑफ कच रीजन्स एंड बिकॉज ऑफ दिस द प्रोजेक्ट ऑल्सो गॉट डिलेड ना अनदर सेट ऑफ चैलेंज was to increase water carrying capacity to address water scarcity in the arid areas so it says that initially the water carrying capacity of the kutch branch canal was kept at 120 cubic meter per second and this was done to irrigate approx 112000 hectares of the kutch district however later the carrying capacity of the canal was almost doubled to 220 cubic meter per second to carry an additional 1 million acre feet flood water from kutch district during monsoon season now another challenge which was faced during construction was that water had to be carried to a higher plane considering the topography of the kutch region so it says that given the topography and the fact that destination of water lies on a higher plane in kutch district three pumping stations had to be built at a height of 18.21 meters Now another challenge to complete the project was that a section of the Kutch Bank Canal is 16 meters above the ground level which is as high as a six story building so all these engineering challenges with respect to construction of the Kutch Bank Canal had to be undertaken and also addressed so this also led to delay in the completion of the project now let us also go through some of the important highlights with respect to Sardar Sarovar project So this project started in 1979 when the Narmada Water Disputes Tribunal issued its final ruling on Gujarat and Madhya Pradesh. Now the hydroelectric power of the project is to be shared by the states of Gujarat, Maharashtra and Madhya Pradesh and the irrigation benefits accrue to the states of Gujarat and also Rajasthan. It further says that the Sardar Sarovar Dam project is said to be the lifeline of Gujarat and has also proved very beneficial resource for rural areas as well as unused water from Narmada River which would otherwise flow into the sea is now presently used after construction of this canal and this serves many dry towns in the arid regions of Gujarat and Madhya Pradesh further it also provides flood protection to an area of about 30000 hectares which is prone to fury of floods further this has also enabled the farmers to get electricity to pump their fields and overall it has increased agricultural production in the region now another important aspect highlighted here is that the area of shulpaneshwar wildlife sanctuary has increased from 150 square kilometers to 607 square kilometers because of increase in wetland due to increased submerged areas So these are some of the important highlights with respect to Sardar Sarovar project. However, certain concerns are also expressed. These are that opening and closure of the dam gates often changes the water level of the submerged area drastically, and this may often leads to flooding and displacement of people from the area. Now the Narmada Bachao Andolan group claims that approx 40,000 families in 192 villages in Madhya Pradesh would be displaced. when the reservoir is filled to its maximum capacity and according to the world bank the sardar sarovar project started with the very little assessment of resettlement and rehabilitation and very less understanding of the environmental impacts which will be caused because of this particular project so these are some of the concerns which have been highlighted regarding the sardar sarovar project thus this news becomes important mainly from your prelims perspective however questions can also be asked from the section of geography in your mains examination with this let's take up the next news for discussion this article of the hindu newspaper appeared in text and context part and talks about the extension of a case that talks about the concept of freebies and whether these freebies should be provided by the political parties or whether these should be promised by the political parties or not what are the ethical dimensions whether these freebies are constitutional or not the supreme court has recently referred to a three judge bench and this bench has been mandated to look into a series of petitions which were filed to the court seeking about the judicial actions now these petitions are demanding the supreme court that supreme court should take the judicial direction 
on the matter that why political parties are making the wild promises before the elections. Like for example, previously in Tamil Nadu, DMK and AIDMK, two political parties in order to gain the vote bank have promised the distribution of color televisions, laptops, gold and even cash. And these promises made by the political parties have been against the ethical standards of election because they sway away or they actually lure the confidence of the voters towards the political party without even bringing the exact vote count on the basis of true judgment. Now the petitions have filed and asked the Supreme Court to look into whether these promises made by the political parties are actually being paid through the money of the taxpayers or not and if yes whether the political parties are making themselves justiciable and accountable to their mandate of voters or not so what we are going to discuss about we'll talk about the case details of subramaniam balaji versus the tamil nadu and the judgment involved we will also look into the aspect of section 123 of representations of people's act which actually have been called to be violative in terms of the corrupt practices while the political parties are promising the freebies. Many of the petitions have been filed which says that the freebies provided by the political parties or promised by the political parties before the elections goes in favour of the corrupt practices mentioned under the section 123 of representation of People's Act. Then we will look into the basic difference between both these acts as this is important in your GS paper 2 and in 2019 UPSC has already asked the question in the means examination with respect to the representation of People's Act. We will also look into the discussion of what freebies are, why freebies have the power derived from the directive principles of the state policy according to some political powers. We will also look into what are the views on freebies with respect to the Election Commission of India, the ethics behind the freebies and the possible way forward. Now let's start with the discussion on the case of S. Subramanian Balaji and the state of Tamil Nadu. This is a very important case. You can quote the same case and the judgment given by the court in the upcoming mains examination or maybe the next year. The petition which was filed was based on the promises made by the DMK and AIDMK to distribute the freebies in their election manifesto, which included the TV, laptop, gold and even the cash prize up to 50,000 to each voter who vote in favor of these political parties. Now, the petitioner in the court has argued that all these expenditure made by this political party is going against and it is unauthorized, impermissible and ultra wise the constitutional mandate. Now why the petitioner has asked that? Because according to the petitioner, the money which is being spent by these political parties after coming into the government is actually taken away from the consolidated fund of those particular states. Now, when the money is coming out of the consolidate of a particular state, it is the taxpayers' money. And these political parties have been sidelining their view by saying that all this money has been spent for the matter of public purposes. But distributing gold, laptops and TV does not fall under the category of normal definition of public purposes. And that is the reason why petitioner has been worried about the misuse of public money by the political parties to gain the vote bank. Now what states have to say and why states we mean the political powers which are part of the ruling government. Now the ruling government or the political parties in power says that the promises which they are making is forming the government which has obligation under the directive principles of state policy to provide the public welfare. So according to these governments or according to these political parties which are making the promises in their manifesto, these promises are nothing but a mean to fill the obligation by the government for the public welfare as mentioned under directive principle of state policy. 
and secondly they say that state is doing its duty to promote the welfare among the people however the term welfare in the directive principle of state policy is not being defined so whether giving a laptop gold or cash to the particular person if they vote in favor of a political party is a welfare or not is still unclear the second thing which is mentioned in the article goes in the ethical manner that if a person without having any allegiance towards the political ideology of the political party is voting for that political party it goes against the ethics of the voter the voter is only going through the lucrative manner to get the particular gold cash or even the laptop so it is like changing the attitude of the voter just to gain the vote bank now because of all these features the petition was filed states have also given their viewpoint and constitutionally states are not wrong after this entire debate what court has to say the court says that the promises by the political parties cannot constitute the corrupt practices because under representation of people's act the corrupt practices only cover individuals and not the political parties so if individual is making a promise to attract the voters through the freebies that individual can be booked under the representation of people's act by election commission of india on the other hand if the entire political party for example the aam aadmi party is promising the free electricity and water cannot be questioned under the representation of people's act so in this manner political parties are legally correct political parties according to the court are not accountable to the public money so they may say anything in the public domain they are not accountable to the constitution or the constitutional functions which are being performed by the government in power so if congress is making any promises congress is not accountable to the constitution but it is the ruling national democratic alliance or the ruling bjp that is actually accountable the third observation by the court says that one can keep the political parties accountable only if they are in the government so if despite making any promises they lose the election so they are not accountable at all because they are not in the power and the concept of public welfare or the public purpose is very open for wider conclusion in the constitution so based on this observation you can utilize these observation while writing the answer the court has suggested the following now as it is out of the legal perspective as it is out of the constitutional reach the court has limited approach and the court has suggested the election commission of india to consult the respective political parties and issue them the respective guidelines so that they can amend their manifesto and do not allure or do not attract the voters just for the sake of getting vote through freebies so the court wants the election commission of india to include all these provisions under model code of conduct now let us talk about the section 123 of representation of people's act 1951 according to this act if an individual gives the bribe gratification to get the votes if an individual do the undue influence for the vote bank in the society if he or she publishes the false information against the other candidate if they are propagating or practicing or commissioning any form of sati system or glorification of any candidate who has done that process if they try to get assistance from the government servants during the election process if they spread their hate among the community on the basis of religion race caste community and language or they try to ask votes on the basis of religion race caste community and language these two points have the same criteria or if a candidate try to capture the election booth through illegal means they will be part of the corrupt practices under the section 123 of representation of people's act now through this entire discussion what we have got that political parties 
are not covered and are not liable for any kind of corrupt practices according to this act. So one of the way forward could be that government along with Election Commission of India can amend the section 123 of the Representation of the People's Act and include the role of political parties among the following points so that Election Commission of India will get the power to arrest or even restrict the political parties from making false or superficial promises during the election. Now from the perspective of GS2 syllabus of UPSC, you should have basic understanding between the difference of representation of People's Act 1950 and 1951. All these pointers are extremely important so do revise them regularly. The Act of 1950 is the pre-election act. So it covers most of the topic which are part of the pre-election process, for example, the allocation of the seats, delimitation of the constituencies, selecting the electoral offices, preparing the electoral rules, manner of filing the seats, elections to the local authorities and how they will be utilized and the jurisdiction of the civil court. Then under Act of 1951, we have mostly the process which is based during the election. It includes the qualification, disqualification of the membership, the notification for the election, functioning of the administrative machinery, registration of political parties, how the election should be conducted, free supply of certain material, disputes after the elections, corrupt practices in electoral office which is actually part of this article. It also talks about the powers of the election commission in the connection of the inquiries, by election, miscellaneous provisions and barring the jurisdiction of certain civil courts. Now with this basic difference, let us look into what is the concept of freebies and how they are attached with the directive principles of state policy. But before that, there are two ways forward that you should look into. In order to solve this concept of freebies, the first thing is that government of India should de-link the freebies from directive principle of state policy and the second thing is that government need to define what actually the freebies are. As far as freebies are concerned, so what they are? They are actually nothing but a promise of providing the free services for the citizen if they vote to a particular political party. So it's a give and take situation. The recent case was seen where Ahmadi party has promised 300 units of electricity to Gujarat. The same they have done in the case of Punjab as well. Does directive principle of state policy favors the providing of freebies? The answer would be yes, but not in a literary manner. Directive principle of state policy calls for the affirmative action that should be taken by the state to fulfill the ideals of socio-economic justice. It also calls for the government to ensure the balance between the welfare policies as well as the ensuring of economic prudence. As DPSP are non-justiciable part of the constitution, anything done by the government is not taken in the legal battle. Now, as I've said, directive principle of state policy does not provide the provision of direct freebies, but the provision given in the DPSP is being used by the governments to provide the freebies in the name of socio-economic justice. Apart from that, Article 38 and Article 39 of the Indian Constitution also provides that state should secure the social order for the promotion of welfare as well as in certain principal policies, a state should provide the welfare to the people. In this regard, state should provide the welfare of the people with respect to justice, society, economic and political. They should also reduce the inequalities, eliminate inequalities, provide the opportunities to the individuals and even to the group. Government should also look into to provide adequate means of livelihood, ownership of the material resources. They should not promote the concentration of wealth, provide equal pay for equal work, as well as promote the health and the strength of the worker, protect children from any kind of abuse and many other provisions. 
So whenever the government or political party in power or the opposition party and try to announce any kind of freebies or a promise before the elections, they try to utilize these provisions in order to make their argument logical. But according to the Supreme Court, it is against the ethical practice of the election. Election Commission says that electoral laws does not allow the Election Commission itself to regulate any kind of freebies. If Election Commission try to control such kind of freebies, it will be an overreach of the Election Commission which is against the law. And Election Commission has also told the Supreme Court that in the absence of law, Election Commission is helpless and it is the duty of the citizens and the voters to decide whether they want to take the freebies and vote for a particular party or not. On the other hand, the Indian bureaucrats have expressed their concern over the rising populist measures of freebies. They say that such schemes are economically unsustainable to the economy and government should take a balanced call to weigh out the political urgency of the fiscal health. Simply means that government and the political party should look into the matter and they should promote political development over the economic expansion. And they should try to balance between their political aspirations and the fiscal health of a state. As far as ethical view is concerned, so yes, freebies are politically and legally a correct measure. But they are ethically wrong. Why? Because such practices go against the honest choices made in a democratic process. So if a person is likely to vote for a party A and party B is trying to give the freebies after the election, that person might change the view because of such political populism. If we go into the debate of whether they should be allowed or not, we'll look into the positive aspects first. Such freebies actually provides and fulfill the mandate of DPSP under Article 38 and 39 that we have already discussed. They allow the state to implement the welfare policies. They help in promotion of agriculture, education, health services to the weaker section. Let's say the 300 units of electricity provided by Ahmadi party in Punjab will benefit the poor farmers. They also are not against any law in the country. As far as negative impact are concerned, so they go against the financial health. So the moment government announces such kind of freebies, they have to pay it from the taxpayers money. Then voters are enticed against their political wishes. The next negative impact is that despite knowing it is unethical, there is no practice which can be termed as illegal because as per section 123 of the representation of the People's Act 1951, it is not illegal. It was stated under the S. Subramaniam Balaji versus state of Tamil Nadu. And lastly, election commission does not have any power as they have no legal backing on model code of conduct. With this discussion in place, let us now move to the next article for the day. This article of the Hindu newspaper is also part of text and context section. According to this article, there are a number of cyber threats which are generating in the field of mobile banking. Now as the number of smartphones is rising across India, the number of users on mobile banking is on the rise. The larger the number of mobile banking users, the larger the number of threats that India is going to face. The threats or the cyber threats in the mobile banking are on the rise annually in India. And that is on what this article is actually based upon. Now cyber security and mobile cyber security is part of your prelim syllabus as well as main syllabus. So in prelims, they can ask questions with respect to the scientific terms such as what is Trojan, what is malware or even what they have previously done is that they have asked the question with respect to the names of important malwares in the country. They can also ask question on cyber security with special focus on the mobile banking or the mobile cyber security in your general studies paper 3 under the heading of national security. So the discussion of this article would include the important studies or the research that have been conducted with respect to the mobile security, various malwares important definitions mentioned in the article, how a mobile banking is being hacked and what are the safety measures available at the individual level. Now according to the article, global cyber security leading firm Kapolsky, which also provides the antivirus systems, has said that in Asia Pacific region, 
both Android as well as iOS devices are facing the increasing cyber attacks. In 2020, Statistia survey has said that half of India's smartphone users are now using this mobile banking system and 31% of that are actually using the mobile phones for financial transactions and banking. But very few of them, less than 1% actually are aware of financial frauds and how to avoid them. As per the article, there are dangerous malwares. Malware is a malicious software. So malicious M-A-L and where comes from software. So malware is a term which is being used combining the two terms malicious software. This software when downloaded to a digital device such as mobile phones or the laptops or computers will alter the functioning of that particular device and they will function against the will of the owner. The few dangerous malwares which are mentioned in the article includes the Anubis, Beyond Lian malware and the Roaming Mantis. Some of the mobile banking Trojans. Now what is a Trojan? Trojan is a malicious code or a malicious software mostly like a malware that actually looks legitimate. When it is in your mobile phone or the device laptops you will find it to be looking like a legitimate the original software but actually it is a malware and that can control your device including your smartphones they can go into the otp or the one time passwords they can also go into the important websites that you visit your email ids your financial transactions and even the photographs and the videos so mobile banking trojans which is also malware is now stealing money from the mobile phone of the users through logging into the applications of those banking. Let's say you have YONO from SBI. So they can actually log in into the YONO going through the passcodes and they can capture the money, transfer the money or steal the money from those applications without the knowledge of the real owner. Now the process is like this. An email or a message that is text message or now even the WhatsApp message will be delivered to the target person. The target person unknowingly click the link given in that page. That link will now open another page of the website and that page is nothing but a phishing page. Once they are on the phishing page, their login credentials are stolen and they are proceeded towards the two-factor authentication. Even the mobile OTPs are being copied by these attackers. They get the entire user devices and the login details. And once they get access to the login details, they can access your bank account from anywhere across the world and transfer the money easily. Now, why India is becoming one of the largest victim of mobile banking hacks? The first thing is that there is a high demand of technical experts who are very less in numbers. The second one is that there is a shortage of technology, engineering, data and security experts needed by the banking sector. Banking sector are mostly looking towards the professional who are good at the finance and economics but less on the technology. There is a lack of adequate cyber security infrastructure in the country. So we are mostly focusing upon the cyber attack on the laptops with respect to the data privacy and not the financial security. And the same is the issue with the dearth of talent in the banking sector. Citizens are not being aware with respect to the mobile banking threats and there is no mass campaign ever conducted by these banks in order to aware their customer base. So what should be done? The first thing is that banks should take the initiative to target the security of each individual. As a person, as a person who is using these mobile application, a person should keep their mobile phone up to date. Whenever there is a software update, please follow that. They need to reboot or restart their phone regularly in order to kill the background application. 
and consumers that is the uh, people who are using the mobile applications for banking purposes should ensure that they should use their mobile phones for banking purpose only and only when it is under the secure virtual private network they should not enter into the fake or poor virtual private network where the threats are at higher platform with this discussion place now i will leave you with this question to practice it is based on the previous year question of the upsc so read this question carefully and try to answer in the comment box now we come to the question of the day the answer to yesterday's question of the day was option b that is statement number 1 and statement number 2 given in the question are correct the question of the day for today is which of the following provisions would be covered under the corrupt practices of section 123 of representation of the people's act you are given the four option identify the correct one and do comment your answer in the comment box that's all for today's daily news simplify thank you